this video focuses on debugging. Specifically, we'll talk about syntax errors, exceptions, and the debugging toolbar, and we'll walk through several examples. There are three types of error. How many of you have made a syntax error when you're trying to write your code? So you're already familiar with that. A syntax error that won't let a script run is something that's in the code, and you'll find that the cursor tries to tell you where the syntax error. It will jump to the first syntax error it sees, or close to. Sometimes it's on the next line, like if you're missing a parenthesis or something, it won't be able to detect exactly where the missing parenthesis is. But if you do this in Python Win, that you try to run the code and it'll give you this message down in the feedback bar, and then the cursor will actually move and tell you, this is where I think the syntax error is. And then you've probably seen another kind of error, which is an exception, where it prints, anybody had red stuff print out at them when they were trying to write things? Uh -huh. These are called exceptions. We mentioned them earlier on, but we're going to go into more detail about how to read those traceback errors. They're sometimes generated by having a variable that you're trying to use a variable that you haven't defined. And that could be because you've spelled it differently than you did when you assigned it. Or you've got an, another kind of problem that allows the code to run. It won't stop with a syntax error before it runs. It'll run to some point, and then it'll throw an exception. Then there are the most insidious kind of errors, which are logic errors. Because your code can run to completion, but not do what you are trying to do. <laughs> and that's usually when you've told it to do something that you don't mean to tell it to do. So make sure you look at that feedback bar. Can you spot the seven syntax mistakes in this code example? So what's, how about, is there anything on this line? We'll start with the, the first line. Well, start with the first line. Is there anything wrong with the comment? Looks OK. You can get away with a lot of sins in your comments. Spelling errors are not detected there. What about on the second line, the import line? Need a comma to separate your imports, your packages. And what about on this line? Yeah, this needs to be an assignment statement instead of a comparison operator. So single equal sign. I haven't seen too many people making that mistake. It's usually the other way around. When you mean to use comparison and you use equal sign, that's a mistake. What else? The one has to be in brackets. Uh-huh. The one has to be in the square brackets, right? Not in parentheses. It looks kind of looks almost right, but it's not. What else? In quotation is missing. You see anything else on this line? Can you really add those together? Can't you? All right, so it depends. So, so dir name returns a what kind of object? A string. And this, when we put the quotes on, <laughs> will be a string. So that should be OK. Should be OK. The forward slash and the backslash. Mm, you know, that won't give you a syntax error. It may throw an exception if it can't find the file because you've got the file path that it doesn't understand. And I'm not sure if slash o is an escape sequence, so it might be, might be able to get away with it at that point. But the forward slash should be OK if you put it at the end, if you put the quotation mark at the end. All right, what else? What's on this line? Not should be all lowercase, yeah? Because it's a Python keyword, and all keywords in Python are lowercase. And there's a colon missing at the end. What about on the next line? Yeah, so this is not going to let it run unless we indent something underneath of here. And with the logic, it seems like we're, we're wanting to check if the directory exists. And if not, do you know what MKDIR stands for? make directory. So it's going to create the directory. And that's how you would do it if you wanted to check if the directory already exists and make it if not. The solutions are down here in case you want to look at that later. Syntax errors, usually they're easy to fix once you figure out where they are. Error messages with the syntax errors are maybe not that helpful, but the, the cursor is jumping close to where the, the 
problem is, so you should look in that area. If you don't find an error on the line that you're looking at, look on the preceding line, because sometimes the cursor is confused and jumps a little for, too far. Common syntax errors, variable names spelled wrong, missing colons for the if and while and for statements. You have to have those at the end of those else statements as well. Inconsistent indentation, we talked about being able to turn on white space and show the tabs or the spaces. You can't mix those. String literals have mismatched quotes. Unclosed bracket, that's a common problem. Of course, the equals instead of equals equals inside of a conditional statement is bad. Do you see any exceptions on, on this one? This is line one, by the way. So one of the problems is, yeah, ArcPy is being used without being imported. Yeah, actually, one will work, but yeah, we've, every time we've gone over it in class, we've used the true, just because it's a little more intuitive. But that's a good, um, good thing to pick out. When it passes to the scale, is it expecting that number to come in as a string? So we've got it hard coded as a number here, so we don't need to worry about. We don't. We don't have any user arguments we're expecting here. Let's look at the make feature layer management. We take a shape file name, which we've defined up here. And we take a layer name, which we've defined on line 7. So we're, what it does is it makes a temporary feature layer out of the shape file, which will be in memory. And then it's going to do a layer to KML conversion. You have to do two steps with the KML tool because it requires a layer. So if you're, if you're trying to get from shape file to KML, you have to first make the feature layer to start with. Okay, so what's it doing on line 13? So this name, I don't see it being defined anywhere. There's close stuff. And it looks like output is being defined here. So this output name is defined and scale is defined, but this one isn't. If you run this code, it'll run. And then it'll get to line 13, line 13, and it'll say, blah, 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 blah. this is not defined. It actually, it, once you learn how to read these traceback messages, it's usually giving you a pretty good hint about what the problem is. But it's a little intimidating at first because it gives you all this extra stuff. It, because it's the script utils.py is what gets triggered when you click run in the Python win, and then that triggers this to run the Python file that we're running. So the script utils tells the current script to run, and on line 13 of that we have this code, and in this code that variable is not defined. It's called a traceback error because it's tracing back through the steps that the Python interpreter did to get to that point in the error. And it's also referred to as an exception. An exception is an error that is detected during the run. So if something goes wrong while the script is running, Python prints a traceback message that includes the name of the exception and the line of the program where the problem occurred, and a traceback, which is all this tracing back to the beginning. So the name of the exception that occurred in this case is a name error. Okay. And we'll talk later in the class about some exceptions that you actually want to handle within your code. You want to anticipate that, say, somebody could try to open a file that doesn't exist, and instead of having this awful red traceback error print out at your poor innocent user, you can protect them from that and print out something more helpful like 
we can't find the file that you are trying to open or something like that. But that'll be another lesson. Those are try acceptor Python keywords we'll go over. Try it, traceback identifies the function that is currently running and then the function that invoked it and then the function that invoked that. So we're talking about script utils, shape to kml underscore debug.py. Functions within those have invoked this function. And then it traces the path of the function invocations that got you to where you are and gives you the line number in your file where each of the calls occurs. So usually with tracebacks that are standard built-in tracebacks, you just want to look at these last two or three lines. You want to look at what line of your own script that error occurred on, and then it shows you the line of code that it's talking about, and then it gives you a brief description of the error. Make sure you have your line numbers turned on, otherwise knowing what line number the error occurred on is not very helpful. And this, the steps for Python Win and PyScript are for This is the file name and the line where it occurred, and this is the erroneous line of code, and this is the name of the exception and the explanation. This occurred on line six, and the line, uh, line six of List fc underscore index.py, and the exception was um, pointing to this code, and it's a name error again, and the, the variable index is being used without being assigned a value. You're trying to use index, and it, it's not defined as far as Python thinks. Look at these two exceptions. Can you answer these three questions about each of these? Where did the exception occur? What exception occurred? And why did the exception occur? Jot your answers. Russell, where did the exception occur in the first one? Line one. Line one of what? <laughs> Line one of what? What's the name of the script where it oh, occurs? List of index. List fc underscore oh. index dot pi. What is the name of the exception that occurred, Anna? Import error. Dylan, what's the explanation? Why did the exception occur? Um, argpy was misspelled as argpy. Yeah, argpy was misspelled as argpy. And he, you can see that if you look closely. It's, but it, instead, it tells you that there's no module named argpy, which may be not that helpful if you don't look closely enough. There's a G in there instead of a C. Samantha, what about the second one? Where, what, where did the exception occur? On line four, On line four of? This yeah, right that's right. This, of the same script that we were talking about before, list fc underscore index. What exception occurred? What's the name of the exception? Error. Index error, yeah. Young, why did the error, what's an explanation for why the index error occurred? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean though, list index out of range? So that's, that's what the computer tells us. In the line of code that it's talking about is sys.argv1, and since it's talking about sys.argv1 and it's getting a list index out of range, that means the user didn't pass any arguments in. It's not that they just didn't pass enough in. They didn't pass any arguments in. So we know that based on the fact that the code is sys.argv1 and it says list index out of range. So where did the exception occur in this one? This is uh, arc error. These sometimes are a little less, less consistent with the other ones. So you have to kind of read this upwards, because this is analysis.py is an ArcGIS script. Actually, the only one that is in here that looks like it came from LG Tadios, that's me, uh, is buffer underscore debug underscore temp dot pi. That's the coder's script. So what line of that code did this error occur on? Line 30. Okay, so see it's kind of sandwiched in between the script run utility and the analysis call. And so if presumably when you're running your script and you get an exception, you know what the name of your script is. So you can look through the traceback and find the place where it mentions your script and find the line of code that it says in there. So where did the exception occur? 
Uh, that's line 30. What exception does it show? Yeah, so right below line 30, it shows you the code that it's talking about, okay? The buffer analysis tool call. So what's the exception in this case? It's an execute error. ArcGIS has a more particular code for it in this case. It's number 732. If you read it, what is it saying? Ctemp narrow fires .shp does not exist or is not supported. Ctemp narrow fires is assigned to what variable? The input, right? The input feature layer. It doesn't need the output to exist before it runs. So it's got to be the input feature layer. What could this mean, that, that this doesn't exist? Is it always literally that it doesn't exist or is not supported? What are some other reasons? What's that? You might have the wrong path specified. Like early on in the class, some people were unzipping things and they were going below what, what we needed them to do. So often that's the case, that it's does, not that it doesn't exist, it just doesn't exist where we're telling it that it should exist. So if you go and open our catalog and click on the data that you want and look at the path that appears up in the path bar, that'll be a way to verify that it is where it is. And also while you're in our catalog, what's another thing you should do? Sometimes the data can be corrupted. Later on we're going to use cursors that can modify the data and screw up the data if you do something wrong. Yeah, it can get corrupted. Just check and see that you can preview the polygons or whatever in our catalog and look at the table. Does it look like it makes sense? And then you have to get off of it and click on something else and hit refresh. Otherwise, it'll be locked when you try to run your code again. So why did the exception occur? Possible reason, misfiled path name or file name or you know, data is not in the directory that you think it is. The file format might not, it can give you this message if the file format is not right for a particular tool. The buffer pretty much handles everything, but if, if you try to do, say, point to polygon, and you pass in a polygon as the input, then you're going to have a problem, right? Because it's going to be trying to look for a point file. Or it could be that the file is corrupted. Yes, Samantha. The question was about saving relative path names. When you're, I think what you're thinking about is when you're in ArcMap, the default is not to use relative path when you share your map. They say it's not, the data's not where it's broken, you get the little red exclamation points. That's not the same. That just means that it could be in some cases that your data is corrupted, but usually it just means that your data is not where it thinks it should be. So when, you're, when you don't have relative path set, your path is explicit. So if I have my data under my user LG Tadios documents, when I save my map, and then I give it to you guys to try to use, and I give you the data, you'll, you'll have the data, but you'll never be able to put it under user LG Tadios documents because you can't log in as me. It's going to be looking for the data where it's not. Exceptions in the interactive windows. One thing that I wanted to point out is that when you are running code in the interactive window, exceptions may look a little bit different. The traceback errors are going to say in interactive input line one all the time. So you don't really care because you know it's the line that you just tried to run that's going to be the problem. It will still give you the type of exception. In this case, it's a type error and it says int object is not callable. Let's look through this code and see what's going on. So remember that built-in function? We went over very early, like first or second day of class, the type built-in function, and it returns the data type of whatever object you pass in. So in this case, the type of range is a built-in function or method. Remember the range method? How context we use that in? Well, we were looping. We built lists of numbers that way. So if we say range of three, it returns 0, 1, 2, and that's because we didn't specify more than one variable, so it de defaults to starting at 0, and then it goes up to but not including 3. So it cre returns a list for us. And suppose you have code where you've got uh, a max, a min, and then you want to use a variable called range. So you end up in your code setting your range to something, like say your range is 5. And then you print your range out. Okay, range is 5. Type of range is what do you expect type of range to be? When you assign it a 5, you expect it to be integer. Int. 
pen, you do the code that you just did a few minutes ago, and it doesn't work anymore. Range of 5 or range of 3 is going to give you a traceback error, and look at the traceback error that it's giving. Type error int object is not callable. The translation of that is it's trying to call a function. It knows it's trying to call a function because you've put parentheses behind the word range. And you've passed in some kind of parameter to it. But the type of range is now integer. So you, you've effectively obliterated your range function, which can't be undone ever until you restart Python. So it just happily allows you to do that. Set range equal to 5. OK, whatever you say. <laughs> but then if you try to use it, it's going to be broken. So that's one of those gotchas, a little bit weird about Python, that you can, you can assign a value to a built-in function. Mm -hmm. and so far as you know, do any IDEs? Yeah, your, your PyScriptor, at least it highlights the built-in functions differently than others. There are ones that will detect it if you try to do that and highlight that for you. Take home message, don't use built-in functions as variable names. You can get a list of the built-in functions by using this code. This has two underscores on each side of built-ins. Or you can go and Google it, Python built-in functions. Yeah, it will get you there quickly, too. So the debugger itself. Debuggers help you look very closely at your code, which is usually what you need to do when you have a problem. You turn on your debugger in Python Win by going to the toolbar and clicking on debugging, and that'll make the debugging bar pop up. So the debugging toolbar looks like this in Python Win. You've got the watch window, which is these little glasses. You can toggle breakpoints. You've got these step buttons. You've got a, a go button, which makes it run in the debugger to, if you set any breakpoints, which are places where the code is going to stop, it'll make it run to the next breakpoint. And if you want to stop a debugging session, you use this one button with the red X on it. So we go into Pi. You can, you can run part of the code and stop wherever you want to stop. So usually you use breakpoints because you know the first 100 lines are fine, and you don't want to do step, step, step through all of those. You just want to run by those really fast and get to the point where the problem is occurring. And we'll talk about these step buttons in more detail when we talk about defining functions themselves. Because usually you want to step in when you've defined a function and step out. But otherwise, if you haven't defined the function, then you probably just want to step over, which is the middle one. So we use the middle button for now. When you're debugging, the little yellow cursor in Python Win shows you where you are. And then this is useful, this window over here for expressions. In PyScript, it actually populates whatever it is. It's got a, a window for whatever is going on at the time, so you don't have to put them in specifically. But I think it's great to actually put them in yourself to list the things that you want to see going on, because then you intentionally put things in that you want to look at, and you look at them. When you want to start a debugging session, there's more than one way to do it, but you can click on the running man, and then you get this little run script window. And in the bottom, there's a choice for running without debugging, or you can step through and debugger. And if you say step through and debugger, then it'll start the code and just put the cursor on the first line of code, first line of non-commented code. And then you can start stepping over and execute each line one at a time. Why is it useful to do that? It's really useful because then you actually look carefully at what your code is doing. If you have that watch going on at the same time, then you can see what all your variables are. It's kind of like having another pair of eyes looking over your shoulder as you code. Don't want to touch this button unless you want to step inside a function. If you mistakenly step inside, you might get into one of the built-in scripts. Don't modify anything when you're in one of the Python's built-in scripts. You just want to step out once you get inside of there. So if you do that by mistake, just keep stepping out until you get back into your own code. I talked about the watch window and the stop button. You have to use this one when you're doing debugging. You have to use this button to stop the code running. 
Breakpoints are one of the great things about debugging. If you have some code that does something that you don't want to step through, say it has some loop that goes a thousand times, you don't want to go step, 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 step. You want to say, all right, my problem is somewhere down in here. Let me just run to that point and then start stepping close you know, very carefully. You can add a breakpoint by putting your, your cursor on the line of code that has a problem and then clicking on the breakpoint button in Python Win. And that's a toggle, so you can turn it on and off with, with this pan button. And so then to start it running so that it goes right to your breakpoint, you use the run button with that arrow symbol on it. So then it is, it'll run, shoom, right to that point, and it'll turn the breakpoint pink, and, and then it'll stop. And then it's up to you to use the step over button to step through the code and watch your expressions as you go. In any debugger, you can also set a condition uh, with your breakpoints. So sometimes you know that something is going wrong on the fifth time through the loop, and you don't need to step through the first four times. So you can actually say, my variable x is equal to 5, then stop at that breakpoint. So that way it'll run up to exactly the point where you want to stop. So that's what this red button on your debugger toolbar does. It turns on that condition window. And then if you have any breakpoints set, you can click and put the condition in the left part of it. Where do you want to use breakpoints? Usually you want to use them inside of code that is doing some kind of condition or some kind of looping. So I usually put breakpoints, say, inside the beginning of a loop, right? So it'll go, run to there, stop there, and then I can loop around and see what's going on inside of there. Or if it's it got conditional statements, I put them inside the beginning of each block, because then you can step through and see when it's going inside of each block of code. And what kinds of things do you usually want to watch? You want to watch iterating variables. <laughs> what is that value? What, what is the value of that thing you think you're looping over when it turns out to not be the value at all? Or output file names are a good one as well. Input values from the user, so you can see what it is that you're actually getting in from the user. If you've, you've got the single quotation marks, for example, on your input, they'll, they'll show up when you watch them with sysargv. Or if you're, you've got a space and you've forgotten to put quotation marks, that'll show when you watch them as you're stepping through variables and conditional statements. So like in this one, I would watch h to see if it is what I think it is. So then I can step and com see what the comparison should be for each. You can even put a whole conditional statement in the watch window, like age greater than 7. You can put whatever is code that's a value, that can be evaluated, you can put that in the window. Cre variables created by concatenation. So I've had a lot of questions over the weekend on one of the scripts where you're supposed to be doing batch processing, and people are not forming that output name correctly. And if you just watch and look at what it is, it, it gets you to the solution a lot faster. Variable paths, directories, variables that appear in traceback error exceptions. Those are good ones to watch. Where to put breakpoints beyond the code that you know works. Script one, I would put a breakpoint maybe here because I already know that my loop works or inside of conditional blocks. So I would put breakpoints on line 8, line 10, line 12, line 14, and line 16 to see what's going on in there. Inside of the, of the loop, inside of this loop, right? Right inside of here on line 10, I would put a breakpoint if I'm debugging this. Inside user-defined functions, we'll talk about that later. And inside of try and accept, we'll also be going over those ones later. And another way to do it is if your code is breaking, you can't figure out why it's breaking, put a breakpoint just a few lines before where it's breaking, and then step through really slowly and watch all the variables. So ways to run in debug mode. There's always more than one right way to do a thing. You can step in. If you have that debugging toolbar turned on, you can just start running the in debug mode by clicking on this. Or, like I said earlier, you can click the running man and say, choose step through in debugger. 
And then once you've chosen that during the particular session, it'll stay on. So if you want to turn that off, you have to go in and, and switch that. Run to the first breakpoint is another way to do it. So you can use that arrow. So this will start it running. If you have no breakpoints in the script, it'll just be the same thing as running the, with the running man. If you click run in debugger in this menu, it'll be the same as running with the go button. And that'll run to the first breakpoint. This is the PyScripter debugging toolbar, and it, it looks pretty much the same. There's one added feature, which is you can click somewhere in the code, and it will run to that cursor, so you don't even have to add a breakpoint to get it to run to there. And you can also click just in the margin next to the code where you want a breakpoint. That'll turn a breakpoint on. And then you run with the one that has a picture of a bug on it. This is code that somebody trying to be really cool, <laughs> but it throws an exception. And, and they came to me and said, why, why, why? And we looked at it and we figured it out that it was not for obvious at first. See what the exception is? Feature layer is not defined, but it looks like we're defining feature layer on line 29 and on line 32 and on line 35. Is it spelled wrong? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yes. yeah, so it's spelled wrong, so if it goes into the first if, then you're in trouble because it's defining a variable name that's very close to that but not the same. If you do go into the first condition and you don't go into any of these other before you get there, you know, if you do go into this first condition, you won't go into either of these other because it's an L if and an else, then you're going to have this problem. So the, the problem that was really confusing was that it would work some of the time. If, if this was true, it was working fine. Or if not, none of the other, if this condition wasn't true, it was working fine. That's what was driving him crazy, because he was like, my code works, but then it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an insidious little thing. And that was, we found that using a debugger, because when you step in and s if you have this, this view in your watch window, then you can see that it's not being defined. So if, you're, if that comes to be your first value when you run it on a certain set of data, then it's not going to be defined there. OK, what happens if you create an infinite loop? If your code just keeps running and running. Has anybody done that, where they've gotten it stuck and then they had to go into the task manager and build the process? <laughs> Another way to do it, so there should be an icon. You may have to expand something, but it'll show a Python win icon. And you right click on that and it'll give you an option to break into running code. You may have to do it more than once sometimes if there's more than one thread going. So sometimes hit it a few times and then it'll stop and it'll get a, give it an in, interrupt error, but it'll be stopped. <laughs> and PyScriptor, you can use Control F2. And this will come into action when you are working on your projects. If you have a big data file, you want to test it on a small file first and get it working for a small example of the data that you want it to work for. You also want to test on multiple files. You get it working, hooray, for one file, test it on another few files <laughs> or directories or, or workspaces. And test it in more than one workspace. Move it around to see if it's portable. For the final project, it needs to be portable because we need to be able to take it, dump it on our computers, and run it. So that may be another reason to build a small test data set. If you're running a project that uses really big data, we don't want it. we don't want to wait two hours while your code runs. You'll need to build a small data set for that. Use the watch window to see if variables are changing. Use breakpoints inside blocks of code, like loops and conditional blocks. Our catalog can interfere, as some of you have noticed, it blocks the data. So if you're trying to work with data that you're viewing currently in our catalog or our map, it may be locked, and you'll get an error thrown when that happens. So the way to, to solve that is to either just close out all of your ArcGIS, or if you only have our catalog open, you can click on something else and ref refresh the other thing. We use that F5 key to refresh the view, and that should unlock the data that's locked. 
Sometimes when all else fails, you have to restart your IDE. Oh, well, when all, all else fails, you may have to restart your computer. <laughs> Let's try Ag Debug 1. I want to see you using some breakpoints and using watch window to watch some variables while you do this one. You just use it as practice to work with the debugger. Now we're ready to start. Let's review the goal of this problem. This should aggregate polygons and produce the output files listed below, but it has problems. Use a debugger to find and repair them. This is the goal. We want to use five different aggregation distances, 100, 300, 500, 700, and 900 meters, and find the output for those. So now we have our goal. We have to save the script first before we can run it. I have my debugging toolbar open already. I think I can slide this around. It's all right over here. And I've turned on one breakpoint. I can turn that off again. Whatever line you're on, the breakpoint will appear on. I want to run to the first line that's inside the loop. So I'm putting a breakpoint on line 7. Takes a moment to import our pi the first time. Need to move this up, but down at the bottom it says running script. So we've successfully imported ArcPy, set the ArcPy workspace. You can see that over here is what we want it to be. Now I'll use the step over button. Use this down a little bit so we can see all of the code. And we're getting an ugly error, an exception thrown down here. Attribute error, let me turn this off for a moment. Attribute error, module object has no attribute aggregate polygons. So it, it doesn't like this line of code. It's saying line 11, up here it says line 11 of my script. Module object has no attribute aggregate polygons. So for some reason it's not recognizing the aggregate polygons tool. Let's go to the ArcGIS help the syntax, and here's the signature, which we've forgotten to put in the toolbox alias. So let's replace that. We can stop our debugging run. Clear the interactive window. Let's try again and run to that point. Don't need this space. It doesn't matter, but looks wrong. <laughs> run to there. Step over. Step over. And now we've got a different error. It's not complaining about our by not having an arc aggregate polygon attribute any longer. It's now saying 
that there's an exception raised when that tool is being called. So that's usually an indicator that there's something wrong with the parameters that are being passed in. Let's have another look at those parameters. I have them set up here on the watch window. Remember, when you want to add something new to the watch window, you have to double click. Where it says new item, you can double click or you can replace one of your existing ones. You double click and then you start typing, otherwise it doesn't get your first letter. We have input, park.shape, it's probably okay. Ag output, that name looks all right. That's similar to the name that we want. We can replace uh, cover 63P here because we want to use park just to make those match up. But yeah, that's the name that we want. And then the aggregate distance is 100 meter. It doesn't care about grammar, so the S doesn't matter, but it looks like there may be something wrong with our aggregation distance. Let's look at that in the interactive window. 100 meters, what's the type? It's a tuple. That is not good. We need to pass in a string. Well, what we're doing here is a comma separated list of values actually creates the tuple. So instead we want to concatenate. Let's try again, clear the interactive window. I have to get my focus back up here. Step over. And we have an ag, ag distance of 100 meter. Now we have a, another error coming out when we try to run the aggregate distance. Cannot set input into parameter aggregation distance. So there's still something wrong with one of our inputs. Parameter's not valid. If you look closely at ag distance, we still have a problem there. There's no space between 100 and meters. You can fix that by doing this. If it bothers you that it doesn't have an S on the end, you can add that, but it should work without it. Now, you may have noticed that we're having to step over several steps that do not necessarily need to be inside the loop because you're doing the same thing every time. So let's fix that. Take these out and come up here. Our input file is the same, it's just our distance that's changing. And we always want to overwrite output. So let's run to our breakpoint again. Oh, I need to reset the breakpoint. I'm just going to clear that all the breakpoints out, click here, and then I can turn the breakpoint on for line 8. Stepping over, and now my aggregate distance, aggregation distance looks good. It's 100 meters. So let's clear the interactive window. Good. Our first output has been reported as 
has been printed at least, so we got past the tool call. So let's go again. But it doesn't create the rest of them. Let's try that again. Maybe it's the override output function. Clearing the interactive window. Okay, run to there. First, so it was created. That means the override output is working properly because we had already created one. We go again, keeps trying to step, but it doesn't want to go inside the loop. Let's see what numdist is. 100, still 100. We want it to increase. We want it to go up to 300 the second time through, but it doesn't seem to be getting there. Before we tackle that, let me just say one thing, that the override output is working because you can either set override output to one or true. Either one of those will work. So reviewing, we were having 100 and not anything else. That should make you suspicious of your looping conditions. Your looping conditions are determined by the sequence that you have behind the for and in. It tells you starting with and stopping with and including. So let's look at that. Yeah, so the, that range function only has the value 100 in it. Let's review the help the range function. Stretch this a little. Help says the start, stop, and step. So we have 100 to start with, that's what we want. 200 to stop with, not what we want. And 1000 a step of 1,000, so we're incrementing by 1,000 every time. So what will happen with our command is that it'll start at 100, it'll add 1,000 to that to make 1,100, and then it'll check if 1,100 is less than 200, which it's not. So it's failing to go back into the loop because we've set up our range function incorrectly. Here's our goal. We want to say 100, 300, 500, 700, 900. So that's a step of 200. And we want it to stop after 900. So we could say 901, or we could say 1000. Anything that higher than 900, but less than 1101. So that's going to give us our desired numbers, okay. stepping 100, 300, 500, 700, 900. Just means we had these mixed around. Clearing this, let's try again. Let's move our breakpoint to here. And then we can run it. So, good. Our first one was created, and now we're about to print out that we've created the second one. Third one, fourth one, fifth one. Great, it looks like we've repaired it using the debugger. One last thing, it's always a good idea to check your data in our catalog. So let's refresh F5. 
and do a preview. That's our input data, our 100 meter aggregation, 300 meters, 500, 700, and 900. It's almost one big blob. The main problems with this script, when you first try to run it, you get an error to do with ArcPy not having a function called aggregate polygons. It actually has an aggregate polygons tool, but the toolbox alias has not been specified on line 11. Toolbox era alias either was Arc or Cartography. I hadn't tested it on Arc, so I encouraged people to use the Cartography toolbox. And you can see that in line 12 of the solution. The next problem was on line 9 of the original script, which has the distance, the aggregation distance, is being created with a comma-separated pair of strings. When you do that, you're actually creating a tuple. So line 9 of the original script creates a tuple for aggregate distance, which is not what you need. You need it to be a string that says, say, 100 meters or 300 meters, and so forth. So on line uh, 10 of the solution script is the correct way to create the, the aggregate distance. Then Another problem, once you solve that problem, and uh, some people forgot to put the blank in the first time they tried to, they just made it into concatenation and then didn't put the blank in. And this one becomes really useful to look at what the, the value of this variable is as you're stepping through. You saw them do that in the in-class exercise. Another problem that script has, it, once you get that working, you get that distance working, you get that tool working, is that it only creates one, one output. And that's because the range function is doing what? Well, it's starting at 100, ending at max of 200, and incrementing by 1,000. When what you really want to do is start at 100, go up to, but not including, 1,000, and increment by 200. Because the in-class exercise showed output of 100, 300, 500, up through 900. So that was the next problem, and that is solved correctly on line 9 of the solution script. Some other problems that were more style related that didn't actually cause the script to not work but will cause problems if you have a bigger script that's running more data. On lines 7 and 8 of the original script, overwrite output is being set repeatedly and the input variable, which is hard-coded, is being set repeatedly. And that's a, entirely un, unnecessary for those to be inside the loop. They should be outside where you, before you start the loop, you just set those up once and then you're done with them. Another point of difference, but so just like we've done in lines four and five, we've moved those override output and input feature to the outside. And then there's another thing that was wrong with this original script, the input variable is called input. In fact, input is one of our built-in functions, so we want to rename that to be something else. Input feature is a good solution. You can do control H to uh, search and replace. In the solution, we've got input feature on lines 5, 7, and 12, for example. Another thing was that this script, the original script, was using a full file path for the park data shape file on line 8. That is not going to cause errors to occur, but it's not it's not good coding practice to use the path full path where you're not needing to use it because then you have to go and change it in more than one place, which can be error prone. So, if you're using that workspace that you've set, just use the the, the base name of the data. So line 5 of the solution has a relative path because we don't need to specify that full path. 
Code to get the file name without the extension was also moved outside of the loop, though this isn't as egregious as the other two lines that were needlessly inside the loop because this was included on a line that did also have dynamic parts. Nevertheless, this has been moved to line 7 in the solution and split ext was used instead of split to make the purpose more obvious. This also means that OS needs to be imported. Finally, uh, another style point. The print statement was made slightly more elaborate to tell the user that data was being created rather than just printing the output name with no further explanation. If you look in the notes view on the PowerPoint slides for the solution to ag debug one, you'll find the points that I've discussed. Next we have another in-class exercise called Superman Debug. The idea is that it asks you a question and you get three chances to answer the question correctly. It's just below Ag Debug. Here's a demo of how it should work. So we run it with no arguments and then it pops up a question. Who's Clark Kent? We say ABBA. We say King Tut. We get a third try and we say Madonna, but of course that's wrong. So it says, ha ha, you don't know S Superman. Then we try again and we put the correct answer in and it says, you are right. So we had to run it a second time because it only gave us three chances to get the answer correct. After three tries, it mocked us and exited the script. We had to run it again to put in the correct answer. The script is linked here. Your goal is to modify the script so that it m duplicates the behavior you saw in that video clip. Three times you're out, or if you get the right answer, it stops. You'll first have to solve some syntax errors, but then use the debugger to watch it, watch the behavior, use those breakpoints and step through. If you get desperate, there are hints in the slide note page. Also keep in mind that you can always post public messages about in-class exercises if you want to start a discussion. This lecture covered syntax errors, built-in exceptions, and how to interpret those traceback messages, logic errors, stepping through code in the debugger, setting breakpoints and breakpoint conditions, and breaking into running code. The combination of these debugging skills should help with tackling difficult problems that arise when you're trying to write complex code. So please take them to heart and put them to use. The next topic will be some more looping essentials and the Call stack is listed at the bottom as additional topics because we, we didn't discuss this in detail, but you'll see that in any IDE that you work with, that there is a call stack available to see more information about the types of objects that are in the memory at the current moment. That's the end of the lecture. Happy debugging!